Welcome, everybody. We're so glad that you're here with us today. We have a wonderful lineup for you today. And uh, my name is Sarah Bunin Benor. I am the director of the HUCJIR Jewish Language Project, a unit of Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion. The mission of the Jewish Language Project is to promote research on, awareness about, and engagement surrounding the many languages spoken and written by Jews throughout history and around the world. And we do this through several initiatives. We've been recording speakers of endangered Jewish languages, especially from Iran, like Judeo Hamadani and Judeo Shirazi, and translating the videos and creating dictionaries. Twice a week, we post fun facts about Jewish languages on social media, and we sell merchandise like posters, tote bags, and apparel, which are raising awareness about Jewish languages in Jewish educational settings and beyond. And we offer online events like this one. You can learn more about all this and subscribe to our email list at jewishlanguages.org. On that site, you'll also find several exhibits, including on liturgy, Passover, and high holidays. Our most recent addition is the exhibit that we're launching in this event and the previous event that we held two weeks ago, A Millennium of Jewish Women's Voices. This exhibit has been in the works for over a year, and I'm gonna share my screen to just show you what this exhibit includes. So here is the uh, page on our website where the exhibit begins and it's an interactive exhibit. So you click on the map and you see a map with dots for each item in the exhibit and a historical timeline showing when these items in the exhibit are from. And for example, if we click on a dot, we see two different songs from uh, this particular time and place. In this case, this is from Tunisia from 1750. And one of them is a writing and poetry, and the other one is a uh, song. So we are, uh, let's see, now, let me uh, stop my share here. And music is an important part of this exhibit. It's also an important part of language revitalization because it brings fragments of the language that's being revitalized to a broader population in an engaging way. We have commissioned several new performances of old songs in many languages by young musicians over the past two years, including Asher Shasho Levy, Chloe Pormorati, Jeremiah Lockwood, Julia Eisenberg, Zichrona Livracha, Galit Dardashti, Alon Azizi, and Adi Kadusi. And today you'll be seeing a music video we commissioned from Milena Kartowski Ayach, and you'll be seeing a performance by Laura El Keslasi. You'll also be hearing some archival recordings of other women singing songs in diverse languages. And now I'm pleased to introduce our moderator for today's panel, Vanessa Paloma Elbaz. Vanessa, Dr. Vanessa Paloma Elbaz is research associate at the Faculty of Music of the University of Cambridge and a Marie Sklodowska Curie Fellow. She was a senior Fulbright research scholar in Morocco in 2007 to 8 and founded Choya, Jewish Morocco Sound Archive, to collect and analyze contemporary and historical sound recordings of Moroccan Jews in 2012. Her PhD from the Sorbonne's Center for Middle Eastern and Mediterranean Studies was entitled Jewish Women's Songs from Northern Morocco, Core Role and Function of a Forgotten Repertoire. And her first monograph will be published by Brill in 2023. And Vanessa is going to introduce the rest of the event and the other panelists, please. Hello, thank you, Sarah, so much. And it is uh, wonderful to be here tonight. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone who is present. Thanks for joining us. I am thrilled to be here, what is tonight in the UK, for this gathering of scholars and scholar performers 
to discuss and hear Jewish women's voices in song and spoken women's voices about these sung voices. When one thinks about song and sound, one is often exclusively concerned with the material in front of us, what we see, what we hear, and what we have access to. However, as anthropologist Yael Navarro's work reminds us, there are situations which warrant a negative methodology so that we realize what we are not hearing, seeing, or having access to. What are the voices that are missing from the canon of Jewish studies? What is the negative sonic space? What are the silences? And when we begin to search for those, we can find that there are recordings. There are traces, written records, and memories discussed in interviews of oral histories that are scattered around or that certain scholars have focused on and that can be further unpacked, understood, and recalibrate the hegemonic narrative about what makes a song, sound, or voice Jewish or not. The voices that we have gathered for you today are highlighting voices in Jewish languages that have gone far too long with little to no recognition, or that were said or assumed to not exist as an expression of Judaism, but as an expression of women's connections to local traditional vocal expressivity assumptions about the secular nature of women's songs in Judeo-Arabic or Judeo-Spanish have kept them separated from discussions where they appear parallel to piyutim, to liturgical poetry and paraliturgical songs. Since they did not appear to transmit key liturgical or religious knowledge, scholars of Judaism often dismissed women's contribution as non-relevant to the furthering of scholarship about how Jews lived their lives Jewishly. We will address the use of the voice by women in Judeo-Spanish, Judeo-Amazir, -Am Judeo-Arabic, and other communities as one of the foundation stones of identity transmission through orality in Judaism. Contrary to a liturgical focused male-dominated musical scene of the public space, Jewish women's contributions are often unheard and erased by the musicology history, theology, and literary establishments, except as a limb absorbed into the grander story of Hebraic, Spanish, French, or Arabic cultural hegemony. I will even posit that the examples you will hear today about transmission are relevant for the transmission of many migrating groups around the world beyond the Jewish example, where women's contributions are silently and consistently ignored over time thus granting almost exclusive cultural hegemonic hierarchy to male voices. What you will find though today, hurrah, is that women have been particularly poised as vital for maintaining cultural transmission through expulsions, migrations, displacements, loss of traditional languages and secularization. Many of these non-Jewish non songs have often served to pass on very Jewish unspoken messages to young women, young couples, brides, and even to those on their deathbeds. Their sonic contribution to Jewish life often weaves through their vernacular languages, but passing a deeply personal and intimate emotional message that only insiders of the group will recognize as theirs. This form of religious, quote unquote, transmission has resisted through the various cataclysms and displacements that different groups that you will hear today have gone through. I was delighted when Sarah Benoir contacted me for this event and told me about the plan for the exhibit, uh, which she mentioned my October 2021 online exhibit about uh, Jewish Saharan women's songs for birth, yalala.org.uk had inspired. This is definitely the way forward in bringing these silenced voices to the fore with many people working towards the reinscription of these previously erased knowledge and a consistent cultural archaeology to reclaim and reinstate silenced voices into the functioning cycle of transmission. I look forward to our discussion today and believe that you will be moved, delighted, intrigued, and inspired by the archival recordings the scholarship and the artistry that we have are so privileged to have been able to gather for you today in this historic panel. 
We look forward to your questions and comments and to continuing this crucial and valuable discussion in the Q&A and hopefully in further future panels um, from today. So I want to now um, introduce uh, Dr. Judith Cohen, who is a Canadian ethnomusicologist, medievalist, singer, and instrumentalist. Um, she will share an audio clip, actually, before this, I think. Is that correct? Um, well, I'll introduce you. Um, she has researched women, Jewish, uh, she, women musicians in Christian, Jewish, and Muslim communities of medieval Iberia, Sephardic music in Montreal and Toronto, and crypto-Jews of rural Portugal. As a singer, Judith performs regularly in Ladino, Yiddish, Portuguese, Castilian, Catalan, Galician, Bulgarian, Croatian, French, Quebecois, Acadian French, medieval Romance languages, and occasionally her native language, English. She's amazing. Uh, she teaches part-time at York University in Toronto and serves as the consultant for Alan Lomax's 1952 Spain collection of recordings, photographs, and, di and diaries. Thank you, Judith, for being with us, and the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Vanessa, and thanks for the introduction. So uh, I'm going to share two very short clips, one from the Sephardic community of Morocco and the other from the other side of the Mediterranean, from Salonika, both from Montreal. So let me, without further ado, because we don't have a lot of time here, call up my PowerPoint and show you who I'm talking about. So we have here, uh, this, these pictures are from a long time ago, as you can see, 1982, so actually exactly 40 years. I was just beginning my doctoral field research in Montreal. There was very little internet. There was, of course, no Facebook or anything like that. So I had no idea I would be sharing this material in this kind of setting, and it's very exciting. So this was Julia. She called herself Julia in Montreal, but in Morocco, she went by Jumol or Jumol. She spelled it a number of ways. And uh, she was from the beautiful town of La Rache in Morocco, born around 1915. I actually don't have her exact date down around 1995. Here she is at home and you can actually see the, the bottom of a picture of a flamenco dancer. And a cheap tambourine, I asked her what kind of frame drum she used and she said whatever is the cheapest in the kids section at Woolworths or Zellers. And here she is at the Club Amitié, the Moroccan Sephardic Friendship Club. And typically when I went to meet people there, they were playing bingo and they would kind of insert whatever songs they sang into the bingo game so that you would get these really interesting things like they would say, you know, Base was on these nous j'ai gagné en la ciudad de Toledo. And then you'd hear part of a narrative ballad and then they'd go back to the bingo game. So she sang me many things. She sang me a lot of narrative ballads, which are called Romance. And this particular one was often used as a wedding song. She sang a lot of other ballads, romances, as well as wedding songs, a few local popular songs, and many, many anecdotes about her life in La Rache. Um, I won't click on it now, but there is an article that is linked, I believe, on the web where you can see a transcription that I did of some of her anecdotes and links to several of her songs. Um, so you can check that out later if you like. Uh, she only sings the first verse here, but this is a common set of lyrics. And what it is, is an old ballad originally about a woman who did commit adultery and was stoned to death, literally stoned like with rocks, not, you know, smoking. and. Uh, at some point in Jewish uh, culture, the, the story got changed so that she was, she resisted the advances of this young man. She refused them. She maintained her honor. And it became a wedding song. <coughs> and many Moroccan Jews added in this little one word refrain again, again, Rawed, Rawed, which they, she doesn't sing here, but they often stick in. And sometimes they add in a verse about Purim and Queen Esther. And sometimes they add in this verse in Hebrew. But here is Jumal singing. Bueno, ahora voy a empezar a cantar, ¿no? Esta rápida So she didn't sing the whole thing all the way through, but it goes on like that. 
estará que lastimosa y lastima que Dios le dio. Siendo mujer de quien era, mujer del gobernador, Raúl, Raúl. And sometimes you'll hear in the same song the pronunciation mujer in modern uh, Castellano, Castilian Spanish, and mujer. And sometimes the women in Morocco will even do that within the same song. But I'm going to move on quickly. This is uh, Buena Sarfati Garfinkel. Garfinkel was her married name, and she became very well known after the publication of some of what she called her complas that she wrote out. They were kind of rhymed toasts. Uh, this is a song that she was singing that's what, probably the best known of all the songs she sang for me. She sang, as you can see here, about 120 songs. But 50 of them had Jewish themes, Holocaust, Zionist, Jewish calendar cycle, life cycle, about six fragments of ballads, narrative ballads, 40 love songs of which 16 were humorous, social commentary, satire, contrafacta, and a few songs in Greek, anecdotes, 500 proverbs, and almost 600 of what she called her complas, and then a lot of background and history and this is her handwriting from photocopy she gave me. So this is a Holocaust copla about Hitler's army. And when she says Tomoel dancing, it took the dancing. It's not dancing, it's Danzig. They took the city of Danzig, Dansk. And here is where she wishes me good luck with my projects. This is a picture of Salonika I took back at the end of 91, but this street isn't there anymore as it is. And here she is singing a very, very well-known Sephardic song, which has a couple of different tunes and the words can actually be found in renaissance spanish music with an entirely different tune or some of the words parts of the words and it's a sort of play on the idea of the dark girl so they call me the dark one i was born fair but with the pasturing my my flocks on the mountains or in the pastures i became dark from the so from the sun and in the renaissance this is actually hooked up with the song of songs verse about you know you are black and comely daughter of jerusalem and um, they actually in the renaissance one do it in latin but uh, sometimes it has greek words in it from a greek song that it borrowed the tune of and sometimes not in her version this is what she sings morena mi me llaman yo blanca nasi. El sol de en verano ya me hizo así morenica, morenica y sabrosica y ojos pretosos. So that's just to give you a very, very quick idea. Her Ladino is really Ladino. It's the kind you hear <clears throat> in all the Ladino courses that are online now. And what's interesting when she writes it out is that she uses a French-based transcription because she studied French. And for example, Alguno, A-L-G-O-U-I-N-O, -O, would be written today without the O. But then if it were French, you would pronounce it Alguno. So she made sure to write it out so that the pronunciation would work. So I'm going to stop the share and go on to the next person. That was just to give you a quick idea of what's there. And both those are in the collection that Sarah and her colleagues have brilliantly put online. You can find them and I, you know, quite easily. Thank you so much. Um, as you can see, this is a uh... You're, you're in for many treats. So thank you for this incredible treasure trove of work. Um, Professor Ruth Davis is an ethnomusicologist specializing in music cultures of North Africa, West Asia, and the wider Mediterranean. Her book projects include Ma'aluf, Reflections on the Arab Andalusian Music of Tunisia in 2004, and Robert Lachman's Oriental Music Broadcasts, a musical ethnography of mandatory Palestine, which includes a two CD set from 2013. She held the first designated position in ethnomusicology in the UK at the University of Cambridge, where she is currently emeritus reader in ethnomusicology and a life fellow of Corpus Christi College.
Thank you, Vanessa. Um, I want to start by thanking three wonderful women, um, <laughs> um, Sarah and Vanessa, and also Abby, Abby Graham, for um, putting our material onto this exhibition. Um, so just to go straight into my presentation, um, I've decided to share extracts from two songs that I recorded in Gerba, which is an island of Tunisia, um, where there's still a Jewish community um, which considers itself to be very ancient. They say they arrived with the destruction of the Second Temple. There's a whole mythology about this, but in reality, a lot of the people, Jewish people who lived there, um, arrived during the Ottoman period, um, as late even as um, 19th, 20th century. Um, there's a whole range of different um, family origins there. Um, but a lot of people came with the Andalusian exodus also. Um, but there are there is evidence from Roman times that the, the, the community is indeed very old and certainly um, pre-Arab. Um, so I arrived there in 1978 to do a jewellery project, but of course my interest was even then on, in the music. And I, I found this musician, this lady who was considered to be the best singer. And I said, well, do you, can you sing me your traditional songs? Do you have any traditional Jewish songs? And she said, no, look, the Jews here, we, we sing the same songs as the Muslims. Oh, thanks, Sarah. Same songs as the Muslims and the women sing the same songs as men, but I'll sing to you if you like. Of course, it was more complex than that. Now this lady only ever sung, sang in private. This was the only occasion, the reason I go back so far with my material is that, that, that I present is that it was the only occasion that she allowed me to um, take a photo of her and for me to record her. Um, she simply didn't take me seriously enough at that time to worry, but she did give me permission to um, use her material in presentations and after she died in 2009, her family has allowed me to um, identify her by name, which is um, Sarah Kabla. But I mean, it was terribly important for her not to be identified as a singer at the time. Um, so maybe we can just go straight into hearing the extracts. Sorry, we, we don't have to continue. Yeah, <laughs> we could have stopped earlier, but I just wanted to give the idea. Thank you very much, Sarah, for um, presenting that for me. Um, so um, the first song was in what's known as Franco Arab. It was a mixture of French and, and uh, Ar um, Arabic. And the second song was in straight Tunisian Darja, which is colloquial Arabic, not Judeo-Arabic, just um, Arabic. 
And both songs were associated with um, Jewish singers. The 1930s, they always referred to Les années 30 as the heyday of, um, of song, in Tunisian song, which where Jew Jewish um, singers, musicians, instrumentalists, um, really dominated the musical scene in Tunis. Um, I want to say a word about this. Um, I think it's worth to, you know, just address the questions. What, why, why do we consider these Jewish languages, or why am I presenting these as Jewish languages, or even Jewish songs? And although the song is actually um, the, the the languages are just the Tunisian vernacular of the time. Um, the Jews have a distinctive pronunciation. So you can immediately tell when a Jewish person is speaking and singing, there's a hallmark, um, um, the consonant, um, the, the Arabic sheen and sin, um, the Jewish people will always pronounce as sh, as, a, as their sheen, rather than distinguish between the two. But there are other, um, other differences in the way of speaking. We're looking now, um, I'm coming into the PowerPoint, uh, at um, Habibi Msika, who is a very, probably today in Tunisia, one of the very few stars of the period um, who's still remembered, although interestingly not always remembered as Jewish. Um, she did not speak with this Jewish pronunciation. She was trained on the stage as an actor and played um, Shakespearean roles translated into Arabic, was known for playing um, male parts. She was actually called the um, Sarah Banhart um, the second at the time. Um, today, she's more widely recommend, um, um, remembered as a singer uh, because we have the recordings of her. We don't have recordings of her, her acting in, in the plays, but at the time, it's, I think it's important to remember her contemporary role. And she's um, she, she's famous until today um, in contemporary Tunisia. But most of the singers of the time were not are simply forgotten. Um, they're just not listened to. They're not um, known. And indeed, there was a backlash against this whole repertoire um, associated with the particularly associated with the Jews, but it's important to mention that Muslim Muslims also sang these songs and were professional singers, including Muslim women. But nevertheless, it's associated with the times where Jewish people were very dominant um, in the musical world. And the there was a, a backlash very much associated with the nationalist movement. Um, which emphasized Arabic and importantly correctly pronounced Arabic and um, correctly grammatically correct Arabic and Arabic definitely not mixed with French in in Tunisian song. Um, the story is again much bigger than that. But um, when I arrived in Tunisia and when I was doing my research in the 1970s and and 80s. Um, this repertoire was simply not, it was not in the mainstream, and if I mentioned it, it was sort of dismissed with sort of some sort of embarrassment, or, well, we, we don't do those sort of songs now, um, within the musical establishment. Um, however, in Harakabira, it was still a living memory, and I think there were deep reasons for this, that it really was a throwback to um, a reminder of the experience of Jewish community of pre-independence times um, before the majority of them had emigrated. Um, these pictures don't really relate to the present, um, to what I'm talking about at present, um, but um, I think the, 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 the um, image that you saw at the top of the um, slideshow of my singer, Sarah. And then immediately afterwards, there was another lady who was, I think she was doing some laundry in her house in Horakabira and wearing the traditional dress. And the reason I included her was that I just wanted to show that Sarah 
Sarah, who was singing these songs to me, was actually, um, she was actually quite exceptional in, in Hara Kabira. She was, um, she lived in Hunsuk. She lived, she had inherited, because she was the only surviving child, her father's um, house. And she was very much um, in a different sort of social class than the Jewish people of Hara Kabira. Sorry to jump in, because we're out of time. We're, we're way over time. Yeah, no, I'm out of time. So I've used up my space. And hopefully some of, there will be some, um, I've given some leads for discussion. We'll have a lot of time, hopefully for further discussion because there's so much richness there. So thank you. Thank you so much. And um, I'm now going to introduce um, Dr. Sarah Manassi, who's an ethnomusicologist and performer of Iraqi Jewish music. And she moved from Bombay to London in 1966. Her ancestor, David Sasson, fled Baghdad, arriving in Bombay in 1832. Sarah has researched secular song by Iraqi Israeli women and published a book called Spahot, Songs of Praise in Babylonian Jewish Tradition from Baghdad to Bombay and London with an accompanying CD, More Precious Than Pearls. She lectured on music at Kingston University, Surrey, and the School of Oriental and African Studies, and founded Rivers of Babylon, performing Iraqi, Jewish, Middle Eastern, and vintage Bollywood numbers. Thank you. Sarah, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. I would really like, like to thank uh, Sarah Bunin Benor and Vanessa Paloma El Baz for asking me to um, participate in this panel and also to Abby Graham for mounting the exhibits. Um, I will share my screen and hopefully that will work. Sorry, we've uh, seemed to have, yes, that's correct. So I'm going to include two versions of the Hena song, Afaki, um, which is in the Iraqi Jewish dialect uh, of Baghdad. And it is sung today too at Hena ceremonies and very much enjoyed. The title Afaki can be translated as bravo or congratulations, but is really not offered in a sincere fashion, rather as a sarcastic backhand jibe by the mother of the groom-to-be who accuses the bride-to-be's mother of intrigue and cunning in ensnaring her unsuspecting lad as a match for the girl. So here we see Signora Halabi, who was a fourth generation Dakaka, a Jewish women's profession associated with the henna ceremony. Signora Halabi's grandmother, Farha Shamma, was a famous Dakaka in Baghdad from around the 1920s to 1940s. Now you see here, Signora Halabi is singing and playing the Nakara, the timpani, which she hits with two sticks. And it's the hitting that gives her the name. Hit is Dak in Arabic, so Dakaka, the one who hits. And she was accompanied by a chorus of two or three women who were known as the Raddadat. The Raddadat were the responders. They sang choruses, and one of them also played a small frame drum or duff. Now, it was a medley of songs that they sang for the henna ceremony, one after the other, and they were all incessantly in the same rhythmic mode, which is known as Ugrug. Today, the Ugrug rhythm is often referred to as Georgina, and it is really quintessentially an Iraqi rhythm, which is heard in secular songs and very, very typically Iraqi. Uh, for the Dakaka to learn the rhythm, she had a mnemonic which, which goes, and it always begins on the upbeat. When she played it, it was a little bit more complicated and she would go, and you will hear that incessantly played through the song, Afaki. Um, 
You can see the words, bravo to you on the trick you've played. Wanat abdu wanashqaitu. I've tired myself and labored. Alal hadal akhaftenu. You've taken them away, ready made. Um, so she has all cunning methods to get the sun. Uh, and for example, the last verse part of it there, you took him down to the cellar and you gave him arak and wine to drink. You got him drunk and you took him. So do listen to her insistent uh, drumming pattern. <laughs> Then. So the most famous uh, Daqaqa in Baghdad during the 1915s, 20s, 30s, 40s was Mas'uda al Bombaylihi or Mas'uda the Bombayite. So Mas'uda had been born in Amara, Iraq, and went with her parents and siblings to Bombay. She then went back to Iraq, to Baghdad, where she married and uh, became a Daqaqa. We don't actually have a photograph of her, but here I hope you can see her mother, Mitwura, standing, and two of her brothers. And very interestingly, her, her niece, Gurjili, who is not actually in this photograph, also performed as a Dakaka in Bombay uh, for the Iraqi Jewish community and as Adada, which was for mourning. Um, though we don't have a photograph of Masouda, this is a photograph of Shoshana Eliyahu, a great niece of Masouda. Shoshana is not a Dakaka, but she has a wide repertoire, including Dakaka songs, religious songs, um, songs for pilgrimages, songs for lullabies. And here you see and will, you will hear Shoshana accompanying herself on the oud with the same song, Afaki, Afaki. And you can see a few more verses. This uh, mother takes uh, the unsuspecting boy to a sorcerer and bewitches him and feeds him kebab and arak and wine and gets to him. So here it is, Shoshana Eliyahu. <laughs> Um, back to Signora Halabi, 
who is who was the last surviving Dakaka that I know of. The interview with her almost didn't happen. Members of my family had helped me to contact her, and she said she couldn't possibly sing for me because her radadat, her chorus, were all in Egypt on holiday. Um, anyway, she finally said they were coming back, so we went to her, and she said, I'm so sorry, they're still on holiday, so I can't possibly sing for you. Then she said, well, maybe the women among you could sing and be radadat, but we didn't know the repertoire, but the men in our party did. And I said, um, maybe if one of them dressed up as a woman, that would be acceptable. And she gamely accepted that and brought this very beautiful scarf and her green velvet house dress and off they went. So that was my story of recording, of recording Signora Halabi. And just finally, some references. Yishak Avishur has a number of verses um, of this song, Afaki. And in Heskel Kojaman's book on the Makam music tradition, he also shows the music as uh, sung by the renowned male singer of Iraqi Makam, which is an art tradition, Rashid al Khundarchi, singing from a vintage recording. So there's really much more to Afaki than I can give you in these few minutes. That, but that's it for now. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for this. And as uh, you have seen so far, our audience, this is just barely scratching the tip of a very large and rich iceberg, which we hope you will really explore um, in the exhibit that has been so masterfully put together and, um, and hopefully will be enriched. Um, so now we're actually going to shift into a performance part of this session, and, um, and then we will have a discussion and question and answer at the end. So please keep, keep the questions coming. We're, we're logging them in, in the Q&A section. And uh, then now we're going to hear from Laura Alkeslasi, who was uh, born in France with Moroccan and Israeli roots. Laura Kislasi is a singer of Judeo-Arab music who lives and works in Brooklyn. In 2021, she released the multimedia album Yagorbati, Divas in Exile, a musical excavation journey, which tells the story of Judeo-Arab divas from mid 20th century North Africa. She has performed music at countless venues, including the Metropolitan Museum of Art, El Museo del Barrio, and the World Music Institute. Okay, Laura, the floor is yours. Thank you, Vanessa. Thank you so much. And thank you, Sarah, as well, for inviting me to this event and for inviting me to contribute to the exhibit, A Millennium of Jewish Women's Voices. So the song that you're going to hear now is indeed derived from my latest musical project, which is called Yarobati Divas in Exile. Um, and as Vanessa said, this project excavates the music of Jewish Arab divas from mid-century um, North Africa. Um, and I, I um, jumped onto this project as really an excavation um, journey um, that weaved the stories of those divas with original recordings and new performances. I read, um, I wrote a folio online press which tells the stories and presents um, new recordings of those archival material. And for me, this um, uh, project was truly a journey of recovering the musical soundscape of my grandparents and most particularly of my grandmothers, because truly these songs were passed on to me, mostly through women who in my family have been the guardians of our culture, uh, being the homemakers uh, in, in Moroccan traditional families. And the, the big questions that I have uh, that I had as I was developing that project were um, following the great rupture of the 50s and the 60s when Jews massively left Arab lands where they had lived for centuries, if not millennia, I really wanted to understand where did the old world go? What was it like? What was the soundscape? Um, how did the rupture between Arab and Jewish worlds come to affect us collectively, individually? Uh, and how I could salvage some of that fleeting past and, and vanishing cultural heritage? And uh, most importantly, in a cultural landscape, as Vanessa mentioned, that's heavily dominated by men because most of the written texts are written by men and the um, liturgical um, canon is also he held exclusively by men. Um, I was wondering what did our foremothers have to tell us? 
Um, and this journey led me to unforeseen encounters with ancestors, real or imaginary. But I'm only going to talk about a little part of it, which is that I looked at three countries of the Maghreb. I looked at Morocco, Tunisia, and Algeria. And I um, highlighted the work of one singer from each country, Zorel Fassia from Morocco, Khbib Sika from Tunisia, and Lin Monti from Algeria. And I was particularly in awe of these women who had the courage to actually enter the public sphere as singers. I think by now you've understood that um, it, it, uh, women did sing a lot privately to this day in private ceremonies, in life cycle events, um, but it wasn't still as particularly looked down upon to, for them to sing in public. So I was curious to see what was their journey around that. Um, so the song you're gonna see now is a song by Lynn Monti, uh, who is an Algerian singer from the 50s that was written by Maurice El Medioni. And in it, she talks about her exile from Algeria. Um, the song starts with the mual where she says, Yaror beti fi ines, oh my exile in the land of others. And these words really crystallize the story of Algerian Jews in the 50s and 60s um, who were forced to leave their country, their ancestral land, um, um, following the, the Algerian war. Um, and really this exodus was the emerged from the confluence of French colonial power, the creation of the state of Israel and the rise of Arab nationalism. And I really wanted to um, look into the core of the issue there. Um, so I'm gonna let Sarah play the, the music now. Um, and you'll see that she truly goes into this very strong, deep um, connection that she has with the land. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
me reconnaître Sorry to leave you all on, on point <laughs> like that, but that's actually good because you'll go back and then really listen to the full video um, and the concert and and all of the different uh, materials here that um, of this work that that Laura has been doing. So thank you so very much for this. Um, please thank keep so the much. questions coming. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Um, and so now um, it is my pleasure to um, also introduce Milena Kartovsky Ayash, who um, is a French Israeli singer, performer, writer, stage director, and anthropologist. She has conducted fieldwork in Israel about political art by young Mizrahi artists in the Moroccan Atlas Mountains on Judeo Berber culture and music, and in Jerba, Tunisia, among the Jewish com community after the Arab Spring founder and artistic director of the performing arts company Le, Le Chaim since 2012. She bridges her research in the social sciences and her work as a practicing artist through anthropological, political, and experimental theater. As a singer, she specializes in Yiddish, Hasidic, and liturgical Jewish music. Okay, Milena, great to see you. The floor is yours. Shalom, good evening, everybody. And to Lata Vanessa and to Lata Sotosara for inviting me to join this project. Uh, thanks a lot uh, to Laura. I'm still uh, very moved by what I heard. My dad is from Algeria. Um, so as we have a very, very uh, a little amount of time, I will tell you the history of, uh, of this song and of this uh, little video that uh, I created in uh, Ankarem, which is a part of Jerusalem where I live. I have left France and Europe since a year and I live in Israel. So 10 years ago, um, I was in Israel and uh, with uh, the film director, Kamal Ashkar, we went to see Khni uh, Nishmoyan, who was, because she died uh, eight years ago, a Jewish uh, woman from uh, the Atlas region, from the little village of Tinrich. And uh, it was just to have a coffee with her, but of course I had my recorder with me. And uh, she started to sing. And she sang for, I think, uh, an hour and a half. And uh, Kamal was filming and I was recording. 
Um, and, uh, and then time passed and two years after in 2014, I went to Morocco uh, after two years of ethnography. And uh, I met the musical Ben Tawargit, uh, which is also from uh, the, At the Atlas Mountain and from Tinrich. And uh, it's a group of uh, young musicians, brothers and cousins uh, who compose and write only in Tamazight. And uh, we became friends. And a few months after I came back and we started a project with uh, the recordings I had from uh, Khmeini Shmoyan and also the recording I made uh, in the Atlas Mountains uh, in the past few years before. Uh, and we were writing songs in Tamazight and in French. And uh, one day um, in the middle of the night after Tajin, we started uh, to sing uh, the song that, one of the songs that uh, Khmeini Shmoyan was singing, Asfalu, which is a little village close to Tinrir. There is a beautiful uh, river. Uh, which passed through this village, and uh, and I recorded it. I don't remember if I recorded it with my phone or with my small recorder. Um, and when Sarah and Vanessa asked me uh, to to do a new version or a version of a Judo Berber song, I was uh, I was thrilled, but I was also like afraid and embarrassed because I've written my uh, master thesis about that, but it was eight years ago, and I was working on other subjects. But I was remembering uh, this song and I decided to pick it up uh, and I found, um, you know, I went to Israel with two, two, two suitcases and my computer um, and I was lucky enough to find the recordings of Hanin Ishmael, but also like while searching in my computer, I found also a video that Kamal took of her with with this song and I didn't know that I had this video and I'm the only one who had the videos today. And uh, I also found out the little recordings we made with uh, Tawargit. And uh, I found a young uh, filmmaker who was just at um, Nitsan Grunval, who's just uh, finishing the uh, Sapir College in Sderot. Um, she has Moroccan origins. And we shoot in a few hours uh, what you are going to see. And then we created it. Uh, and I added a voice that I recorded in Ankaran to the song. And the song is dealing, uh, is talking about a beautiful woman from Asfalu. And it's also a song of longing and of nostalgia for this village. Okay, thank you. So now we'll Let's see. כדי לזכור, להציל, כדי לשמוע, להציל כדי לשיר יום אחד שוב את הנחל והציפור, להציל משם לכאן, להציל כדי לדעת מי היינו, מי אנחנו. להציל עולם שלם בתוך שיר אחד. להציל כמה דקות מחילות נצח. להציל. להציל. כדי לחיות. Thank <laughs> you. بنتي يشغل مهدي المسلمة الكبيرة كان يشغل مزقية الملفاز آي إلا غيف شي أنو دلالة وحدة دي أنو دلالة وحدة دي إلا غيف شي أنو يرقل يامي شيعي 
actually lucky to be able to all go into this panel discussion um, with all the different uh, panelists. And I think that one of the things that would be really interesting for us to do with each other as we're in the same room tonight is to discuss uh, possibly like what are the, what are the methods of transmission that we've seen um, and that we've engaged with. Um, some of the of the scholars are also performers. Um, others have actually been um, transmitting in other manners. So so what is the function of transmission and gender, I would say, and and in which manners um, do you have you witnessed this and do you and do you see it going in the future? Um, so I'd like to kind of put that open question to all the panelists. Please jump in. Okay. 
Sorry, Vanessa, can you kind of repeat the question, maybe breaking it down into a couple of parts? Because it's, you know, kind of a dissertation for each of us to answer. It's... Well, I think uh, there was a question that came in through the Q&A about how did the, the mothers and daughters um, transmit this, right? But it's, I, I know from my own research that it's not just mothers and daughters, right? It's also aunts and it's, you know, uncles and rabbis and friends. And so what what is it that you've seen and what is it that you've how has it been transmitted to you as well and so in these both and and then the the next bit is and what's ha what happens next right uh, well I can answer the first bit I don't know about the next bit but um in terms of the two women whose stories and songs I showed one of them uh Jumole Deri in Morocco was born around 1910 learned a lot from her mother but also she told me that her father was a python a liturgical singer and that her mother as she put it helped him and that he would always say to her mother mi bueno can you help me with these songs and so she as a daughter learned a lot of that repertoire as well and buena sarfati learned from her family but actually she grew up when the recording industry was really coming into its first really strong wave in the former ottoman lands and she learned a lot from recordings and like records, you know, record players. And she would actually say, so-and-so had a new record and, you know, we all went over to hear it. So I think a real variety of sources and the women I interviewed over the years also had this real variety. Many learned from their mothers and grandmothers, but also learned from others. Buena, uh, what's your name? Um, Berta Bienvenida Aguado told me that she learned most of her fantastic romance repertoire from her father, which is unusual, and she had no children. But dozens and dozens and dozens of us learned from her and from her recordings. And my whole repertoire as a performer is not from my family at all, except maybe one or two Yiddish songs from my Auntie Gertie. Everything else is from summer camp, from the people I recorded for my dissertation, from you know, years and years and years of traveling and, and recording from people or just learning um, informally. So a real variety. And in terms of the future, all I can say is my daughter, as many of you know, learned a lot of songs from me, but interprets them in entirely different ways. So she's capable of singing anything she's learned from me in a traditional way, but she's chosen in many cases not to. So that's a quick one. And also in the villages in Spain and Portugal, sorry, many people have learned traditional songs from their mothers and grandmothers. They rejected things like the vocal timbre, which for me is one of the most important parts of tradition, more than actually the, the notes and the specific rhythm patterns. They rejected them, but then many of them actually deliberately went back to them and try and recreate them. So I see a very varied future. Just unmute yourself, Ruth. Just please jump in. The yeah, if I, if I could in, just please. jump in and actually partly triggered by um, what Judith has said, but in just um, simplifying from my own experience, I think a key word with women's transmission is, is informality. Um, I mean, it it happens. It, there isn't a specific space, a specific necessarily a specific time. And there can be. There can be occasions, like for instance, the henna before marriage. You know, henna parties. There can be specific occasions, but so very often it's not. And um, I mean, Milena's story. She goes. She visits this lady um, for coffee, and she sings. <laughs> You know, I mean, there's no reason that she should be singing. She wasn't expected to sing, but she sang. And this is, I find this so much. Um, the recordings I made were made at a child's birthday party. And, you know, the party was over. It was a little girl of three and there were a lot of people around and then they dispersed. And and Sarah Kabla sang and her daughters were there. And, and the other thing I wanted to say, I, I think was worth saying, um, that also came out of what Judith has said, was the... We shouldn't assume that women's transmission goes between from women to woman to woman or woman to girl. It's it's because it takes place um, in domestic settings or traditionally did. Um, the, the, it, it can take place within the family and um, sons and both sons and daughters 
um, are exposed to the songs that their mothers sing. And I really, I think there's a, a very big question how much repertory that we think of as male repertory that comes onto the public stage um, as um, supposedly even composed by men were not actually um, <laughs> learnt as women's, you know, in the house from mothers. Um, Sheikh El Afrit actually acknowledged his own mother as the source of a lot of his repertoire. Um, and I, I, I suspect that some of the texts, some of the, you know, you can, from the lyrics that we hear, um, I, I, I think there's a big question there. Anyway, thoughts? I think another question that people would like to know is about how, what is the process of, um, of finding repertoire, finding songs and recording them, and uh, how, how have some of you done that work? Just unmute yourself, Sarah. I was trying to, sorry. <laughs> Um, yes, I think one way is to actually go and live in a community if you want to particularly know about what that what the traditions are in that community to so go and live there at least for a few months and go to parties, go to rehearsals, go on. I went on many tiulim on excursions where people played and then obviously interview people who are, are known to to know the repertoire. So I, I think probably that is the most important way of doing it. But clearly nowadays there are so many recordings and things that even if you don't go and live in, among the community, you can pick things up on YouTube, on recordings. So there are so many different ways now uh, of learning a tradition. Um, yes, I think also just going back to one or two things that were said, we, we tend to um, compartmentalize things into women's and men's and all this. But really, it's, as you say, as people have said, it's everyone doing mostly everything. And uh, even with lullabies, which are supposed to be a women, woman's tradition, um, men have said to me, how could we grow up feeling happy when we heard our mothers singing these sad lullabies? So I, I think, you know, it's, um, yeah. So your question was, how do we go about learning it? And I think that for me anyway, the way was to be within the community go to Israel, be among the Iraqi Jewish community. But nowadays with YouTube and recordings, there's so many more ways. Lena, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I, I want to add something. Um, so first of all, uh, the generation who knew the tradition is uh, almost gone. I live in Israel and I know. Uh, and it depends also like which field, which community we are talking about. Unfortunately, um, Berber women and Berber Jewish people who were living in the Atlas Mountain or in the source, um, there was an, an extensive work which was done uh, in Israel or somewhere else. And unfortunately, you can barely find informants today. So when I did my ethnography nine years ago, I, was, I went as, as a young girl in the Atlas Mountain and I tried to recall the old, old Muslim people who were singing with Jews, especially also Ahwash and Ahidus. But I came too late already. Um, so I'm also thinking about um, the repertoire of the uh, Jewish woman prayers in Yiddish, uh, we barely have recordings and all around the world it's like this. So there is like time is running and I think that this project is very important because it can also show us where there is a vacuum and what can we do, but it's now. It's really now and not tomorrow. So I want to ask um, the, the performers here, uh, what's the balance between preservation and innovation in this process of uh, learning these traditional songs and then performing them? I mean, I myself as kind of straddling these worlds have made certain choices and uh, sometimes they work and sometimes they don't, but um, I'd love to to hear what other what other people have to say about it. What's your approach to it? 
Well, um, I can jump in to say that th that's always a question that's on my mind uh, when performing and when preparing a new song, which is that, and oftentimes the uh, position that I try to take is that I want the material to be very much rooted in the tradition. Um, so I want to honor um, the traditional sound. Um, but uh, as I was developing Yaror Betty, for example, I was working with um, music director Ayo and Temple, who is also a, a klezmer specialist um, and who has done a lot of this work for Yiddish music of, of um, unearthing music and reinventing uh, it. And so as we were working on that together, um, it was also clear to us that um, it was important to reinvent the material to innovate it to innovate and to give our own interpretation to the material in a context that's the context of today um and so um that also i mean uh, that has meaning you know as an artist but also for the audience it makes it somewhat more accessible and there are a lot of people to give ourselves a little bit of hope because there's been a lot of loss <laughs> there are a lot of people now in the third generation thankfully who are doing this work of like um uh, uncovering this material again and putting their own touch to it i think of metal Kayam, i think of in the moroccan side abir el abed just came just released like a an album um, a song uh, on the where, where she's bringing you know electronic sounds etc to that and i think that a lot of the new generation is is doing that so that the music remains accessible but yet rooted in tradition i would love to stay for hours talking with all of you but um we have a schedule and so i'm going to now thank everybody that it was here and that prepared all these things and um pass it on to introduce uh, dr hannah pressman who's the jewish language project director of education and engagement hannah it's great to um to be here all talking together in the same room thank you it is it's so wonderful vanessa thank you so much for moderating um, today's panel with such warmth and expertise. Um, and yes, on behalf of the HUC JIR Jewish Language Project, I'd like to thank everyone in the audience for attending today's launch event for our new online exhibit, A Millennium of Jewish Women's Voices. We appreciate the generous support of the following co-sponsors. HUC JIR Initiative Grant in honor of the 50th anniversary of Sally Prezan's ordination, American Sephardi Federation Institute of Jewish Experience, Cambridge University Library, Geniza Research Unit, Jewish Arts Collaborative, Jewish Music Institute, Jewish Music Research Center, Jemena, Jewish Women's Archive, Lilith Magazine, Lowell Milken Center for Music of American Jewish Experience, at the UCLA Herb Alpert School of Music, Mother Tongue, Oxford School of Rare Jewish Languages at the Oxford Center for Hebrew and Jewish Studies, Posen Library of Jewish Culture and Civilization, Sephardic Mizrahi Q Network, Strom Center for Jewish Studies at the University of Washington, UC Berkeley Magnus Museum, and Yeshivat Maharat. So many wonderful co-sponsors, thank you. Thank you also to exhibit curator Abby Graham, Zhenya Gutova, and many Jewish Language Project staff members for their help with the exhibit, and to our documentation manager, Jacob Podner, for his technical support on today's Zoom. Lastly, thank you again to all of our panelists for being with us today and for your valuable contributions to this exciting and very necessary field of study. Part of the Jewish Language Project's core mission is to regularly convene experts across disciplines, as well as speakers and heritage learners to share their findings and thereby raise awareness of Jewish languages both their rich history and their current precariousness. We provide these programs to the public free of charge so that all can come and learn. The Jewish Language Project is a nonprofit organization and we rely on donor support to keep our initiatives going. This is critical time sensitive work in the field of language preservation. We view a millennium of Jewish women's voices as proof of concept for a broader future exhibit on Jewish languages around the world. You can help us advance this important mission by supporting our current fundraiser. And Sarah's going to drop the link for that in the chat. 
You can also reach the fundraiser by clicking on the donate button anywhere on our homepage and website. Your gift will help ensure that anyone, now and in the future, can access a whole world of Jewish languages. Thank you so much. Today's panel on living traditions is our last event for the fall. Coming up this winter and spring, we're offering a 12 week course on endangered Jewish languages. We're presenting this very special opportunity with Judaism Unbound and Un Yeshiva. And we've got some of the world's foremost linguists teaching about these languages. The course starts February 5th and runs through the end of April. Registration will be opening up soon, so please check our events page for all the details. There are lots of ways to plug into what's going on at the Jewish Language Project. Our website, jewishlanguages.org, has several exhibits and language resources like the Jewish English Lexicon. If you're not already following us on social media, you can find the Jewish Language Project on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We post fun facts twice a week, as well as the latest news related to Jewish languages. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel to check out videos of past events, songs, interviews, and more. And as of this fall, we've got merch. Check out our Redbubble shop for all kinds of fun items like mugs, puzzles, posters, aprons, and more. All proceeds of the shop support our initiatives. The very best way to keep up with all of our activities is to subscribe to our email list for occasional updates about events, programming, and research. Here at the Jewish Language Project, we believe that there is a world of history in every Jewish language, and each speak speaker or singer has something to teach us. To illustrate that point, we will leave you today with a wonderful new video that brings to life the earliest artifact in our exhibit. Here are Lara El Kaslasi and Yoni Avi Batat with Will Her Love Remember, which features a musical rendition of a poem by the wife of Dunash Ibn Labrat from the year 990. Take care and we hope to see you soon. <laughs>